10. I want to talk about some of the titles for our Savior, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of David. We want to talk about those fields that are white under harvest, uh, the, the, the harvest that is plenteous, but the laborers which are few. And we want to talk about some uh, people that, uh, that in great need and desperation in, in searching were able to pick out Jesus from the crowd almost instantly, whereas the religious elite, the educated, and the uh, socially prominent folks had a little bit of a harder time figuring out who he was, or I should say accepting who he was. Uh, wasn't that they were uh, ignorant of all the prophecies and the promises concerning the coming Messiah. It wasn't that they were ignorant of all the miracles that Christ performed while he was uh, engaged in his earthly ministry. It was just that they didn't want him. They didn't want the Son of God to break in and disrupt their comfortable lives. And so we'll uh, take a look at the different responses we see from some different uh, figures and characters through God's Word. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 27, we have Jesus departing, and where he's departing is the official, or Jairus' home, where he has just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And he's departing, and it says, Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. And Jesus himself said that a city on a hill cannot be hid. Jesus is... A, a citadel, a fortress, a city, prominently displayed, doing things that no man ever walked the earth before was able to accomplish. And so, try as he might, he cannot silence those who have seen his work. And uh, we, he, he's told devils to shut up, he's told people to keep it to themselves, he's told uh, people to be private and just show themselves to the priest, but not let them know that it was him that healed them, uh, but they can't help it. When, when God transforms our lives, uh, we want to tell someone about it. When we see a gas station with five cents cheaper a gallon fuel, we want to post it on Facebook, let everyone know where they can save a few cents on, on gas. How much more when the Son of God comes to live in my heart and changes my eternal destiny, exchanges despair for hope. And so they couldn't help it. They were blind and now they see. <laughs> and they spread his fame in all that country. Well, even if they didn't go out and actively say, let me tell you what happened to me, people that knew them before are going to have a few questions about what happened to them. Where's your cane? Where's your dog? Where's your family and friends leading you about? Uh, where are your eyes which aren't able to focus in any particular direction? Now I can see your vision is sharp and your eye is keen. <clears throat> what happened to you? Well, he told me not to tell you, but I can't help it. Let me just tell you. So these men, uh, they, they went out and published his uh, fame abroad, but notice, they call him the Son of David. That is a very specific title. That title occurs 25 times uh, throughout the scripture, and sometimes it refers to a literal son of David, such as Solomon. In this case, it refers to the coming Messiah. The Israelites were very familiar with the promises that a son of Adam, and a, or, I'm sorry, a son of Eve, actually, the seed of the woman, and the son of Abraham and a son of David was going to come and set things right for Israel. There would be peace over all the earth, but most importantly to the sons of Abraham, there would be peace in Jerusalem, and they would live at peace with their neighbors and be prosperous and have uh, just basically that, that, that utopian society that everyone is, is, is looking for. Israel knows that her coming Messiah will rule and reign in righteousness and bring peace. And so they call him the son of David, knowing what that means. This means something very special. This just isn't any common <coughs> man walking by. This isn't a, a magician doing uh, tricks in the street. This is the, 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 the Christ. This is the promised one. This is the son of the blessed. This is the son, the son of David who can heal us. Notice before that the uh, official, his name is Jairus from another gospel, but the official worshipped Jesus 
when he asked him to come and heal his daughter, to raise her from the dead. And we have the mother of James and John worshiping Jesus and then asking him to make her sons prominent, to sit on his right and on his left hand when he comes in glory. And we have even the demoniacs in, in, in Gadarenes worshiping, knowing there's something about this man that transcends anyone else that's ever walked the earth. And so devil-possessed people, oh, by the way, in Acts, you have a, 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 a woman that's a young lady who's doing divination, and she's possessed of a devil, and she says of Paul and Barnabas, these men uh, proclaim to us the way of salvation. They're serving Almighty God, and his name is Jesus Christ. So the devils know who he is, the blind men know who he is, the officials know who he is, the Roman centurion who said, you don't even need to come to my house, you can just say it from here, and I know my servant will be healed. He knew, and yet when the religious are confronted, the religious elite, the ones who should know better, are confronted with this man from heaven, they have, they have no ability to accept him. In Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, and in verse 61, Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin, before he's handed over to Pilate and, and to Herod for trial. They try him first, and Mark 14, verse 61 says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Those are two terms which only apply to one person in history, and that's the Son of God. And they all know it. And Jesus said, I am. Now the words I am are another term which only applies to Almighty God. When you see it in the Old Testament, it's capital O-L-O-R-D. And it's Almighty Jehovah, the God of heaven. And Jesus answered their question, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, in the affirmative? But the affirmative he used was another title which only belongs to Almighty God. I am. You shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Now it's this... Uh, this slippery thing that modern religion tries to accomplish, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and New Age, and anyone who doesn't receive Christ as Almighty God in the flesh will say he wasn't the Son of God, but he was a great man. He was a great prophet. He was a great teacher. He was a great leader. We should follow his example. Well, if he called himself Almighty God and was not, then he's a liar. We should not follow his example. We should not follow his teachings. And C.S. Lewis said, you either receive Jesus as Lord, liar, or lunatic. He's either outright lying about who he is, or he's self-deceived or crazy and doesn't understand who he is, or he is exactly who he claims to be. Those are the only three options, and as C.S. Lewis said, he hasn't left any other option available to us, and he didn't intend to. Receive him as is, or condemn him as a heretic, or feel sorry for him as someone who needs uh, to go to the doctor's office. He's not a good teacher if he's not the son of God. Okay, uh, so, so the, they weren't able to receive it. By the way, it wasn't a matter of education. They knew all the prophecies. They knew the Messiah should come from Bethlehem. They knew the Messiah should be born of a virgin. They knew the Messiah would come from the line of David. Uh, they knew all these prophecies from centuries ago about the Messiah, and they knew that the claims about Christ fit every one of those prophecies, so it wasn't a matter of ignorance, it was a matter of pride. When you're confronted with the Son of God, and you have to get off the throne and let Him on, some people don't want to do it. I'll admit from time to time, I kick Jesus off the throne in my heart. I'm very ashamed of it. But thankfully, He allows us to get up, allow Him back on, and fall at His feet. But if you haven't received him as your, as your Savior, it's about time to do that. Okay, the Son of David appears 25 times. As I said before, sometimes it applies to the literal Son of David, Solomon, and many times it uh, applies to the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. The term Son of God appears 47 times, and almost always is a reference to God in the flesh. 
And the Son of Man appears 193 times in the Scripture and is oftentimes a reference to the Messiah. Now, the Son of Man is an Israelite. It's a Jewish term, and it's particular to the nation of Israel. And let me ask a quick question. Out of Son of Man or Son of God, which would you think is a higher title? Son of God. I would think that too. But what's interesting is that Son of Man is presupposing the deity of Christ. They're not arguing that he's the Son of God. They're already accepting that. And they're saying, but he has come to earth as man. They're arguing his humanity. They're not arguing his deity because that's a foregone conclusion. So believe it or not, Son of Man is actually a higher title, a more prestigious title. Son of God is for us Gentiles. It's easy to believe that a Caesar in his palace could be the Son of God. It's easy to believe that a Pharaoh uh, in Egypt could be the Son of God. It's very difficult to believe that a carpenter born in Bethlehem is the Son of God. And the first time this title is used, it's used by a Gentile king named Nebuchadnezzar when he threw three men in a fiery furnace and he looked in and saw the fourth man and said, that fourth man is as the Son of God. Uh, so that is a very Gentile term, and if you feel a particular affinity to that term, as I do, I love the term Son of God. It just got some, it's got some meat, some, some gravity to it. That's because we're Gentiles. But if we were Jewish, more than likely we would gravitate towards Son of Man or Son of David. All three apply to Christ. Christ means anointed one and it's in, in, in Greek, and it's Messiah in Hebrew. So when you see Messiah and Christ, they're interchangeable. They're simply two different languages, but they're all about God in the flesh. Okay, so uh, notice, too, that the blind men ask for help. You can't be given sight until you admit you're blind. You can't be healed from leprosy until you admit you're unclean. You can't be healed from lame, being lame until you admit you're unable to get up and walk on your own. And so these people were had fully confronted and accepted their current circumstance and realized that this one man was their only hope. And they put all their hope in him, put all their eggs in the Christ basket. Just like the woman who said, for 12 years the physicians have failed to heal me. Here comes walking by this man and I need to touch his robe and be healed. Power over dumbness. Uh, there was a dumb man possessed with the devil. It means he was unable to speak. It also means, because those are two different phrases, that sometimes dumbness is a, a natural effect and sometimes there could be a spiritual uh, evil involved in it. But it uh, doesn't have to be. It just happened to be in this case. And the devil cast out and he spoke again. The multitude marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he cast out devils through the prince of devils. It's a, it, it's a dog and pony show. It's smoke and mirrors. And the devil, believe it or not, can and does replicate the miracles of God. He's even going to have a man, at least seemingly, if not actually, die and rise from the dead, called the Antichrist, who is going to convince the world that he is the Son of God. <laughs> The devil replicates these things. Be very careful when you see or hear about miracles that they are coming in the name of the Son of God and not some other uh, person that you have not yet received. Power over disease. In verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And so he just goes about doing good. And notice that there's teaching accompanying it. He's not just healing people. Uh, to impress them or to make them feel better. He wants them to learn and grow from it. He wants them to come closer to his Father in heaven through this experience. And then it says in verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted or scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I spoke, I think, several times on the fact that I truly believe that the seven churches listed in, in Revelation are representative of seven ages uh, throughout the last 2,000 years, and they, are progressed, they, are, they progress from Ephesus through Laodicea. I don't think there's any question when you read the rebukes to the church at Laodicea, <coughs> they're rich, they're well-fed, and they got lots of free time, 
Uh, they, they say they're rich and increased with goods, but they're actually poor, wretched, miserable, and blind. They're lukewarm. They can't get hot. They can't get cold. They're just kind of wishy-washy and good for nothing. I think you look around the world today and say, yep, that's us today. But immediately preceding us was a church called Philadelphia, which Jesus said, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut. And he's going to send them out into the world. And during, uh, uh, from about the time before the American Revolution uh, to the time of the turn of the 20th century, there was this missionary and evangelism explosion around the world. Where, where the Baptist churches and the Methodist churches and the Presbyterian churches uh, and, and all got together and said, let's not try to reinvent the wheel. If the Methodists are already in sub-Saharan Africa, go there, convert the people to Christ. If the Baptists are already over in India, we're not going to try to walk over your territory, you stay there. And they divided the world up and said, let's win the world for Christ. I wish they had paid a little more attention to the United States. We could use some help today. But the fact is that there was an open door before that church and everywhere they went. People who had never heard the name of Jesus, never knew that God loved them, never knew that God's Son came and died for their sins, gladly received the gospel and, 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 and gained a home in heaven through faith in Christ. And today, I believe that we are called to the corners of the field. Through the Philadelphian explosion, the center of the field was harvested and harvested and harvested and harvested over again. And I believe in the middle of the field there's nothing but a bunch of bent over canes that have already been plucked. I believe that you and I are called today to glean in the corners. God told the Israelites when they harvested in their fields to leave the corners for the poor. And Revelation chapter 3 refers to the Laodicean church as poor. And I believe we are called to go to the corners and the problem with the church today is that we want to stay comfortable. We want to stay where it's safe. We want to stay in the middle. We don't want to get close to the edges. Who knows what's out there? Who knows what lies beyond? Uh, it's kind of weird out there. The people outside the camp, outside the gate that Jesus called us to in Hebrews, he said, I suffered without the camp. Now you come and join me there too. And uh, we're not comfortable. We want to stay where we got plenty to eat. We want to stay where the temperature is just right. We want to stay where the people uh, aren't too hot or too cold. They're just kind of average. We want to be comfortable and feel safe. And I believe today, if we are going to be a church that's on fire for Christ, we need to go to the corners of the field where no one else is. Where the people smell funny, where they don't have a lot of money to pay in the offering, to put in the offering, where they have a lot of strange ideas, where they didn't have good families that they grew up and had very difficult home life, where, where there's drug and alcohol addiction, where there's uh, abuse in families, uh, where there's uh, destructive relationships. We need to be out there where people are still able and willing to receive some good news. It's hard to get a bunch of fat, lazy, average people to get excited about anything. But it's, I think, very necessary to go out and find people that are hungry and want something good. They're thirsty and want something clean and clear and refreshing to drink. And this gospel is that food and that drink. Let us receive it first, and then let's go to the very edges and corners the field and look for the plenteous harvest. God has left it there for us if we want to go find it. Invite the music team forward.